Welcome to Transform, a podcast highlighting the people and ideas shaping the future of senior living. I'm Tim Regan for Senior Housing News. On today's episode, I spoke with Andrew Carl, a senior living expert with experience in leadership positions in academia and community operations. About two years ago, Carl took the reins as an executive director at The Virginian, a CCRC in Fairfax, Virginia, managed by Life Care Services. What he didn't know at the time was that a global pandemic was right around the corner. But as challenging as the last two years have been, the experience has also given Carl a new perspective on where the senior living industry needs to change for the future. We need experienced executives, we need new models of housing that people want to live in, and then we need these technologies to make sure we can run them. But before we get to that interview, I wanted to promote our next BUILD conference happening in Chicago on November 17 and 18. BUILD is an annual event dedicated to the latest trends in senior living architecture, design, and innovation for owners, operators, and developers. Hear how industry players are redefining senior living development and planting their stakes now to reshape the future. Be sure to visit SeniorHousingNews.com slash events for the latest updates on Build and our other scheduled events. And now, here's my interview with Andrew Carl, Senior Living Expert and Executive Director of The Virginian. Andrew Carl, thank you so much for joining me on Transform today. I wanted to actually start. So you were a guy who wears many hats in this industry. I think I, I actually know you best as a kind of a senior living and gerontology technology expert. But I know these days you're also an executive director. You work at the Virginia and LCS community in Fairfax, Virginia. You're also an adjunct lecturer at Georgetown in their senior living concentration program. So you're all over the place. I remember when you came aboard at the Virginia and you, you kind of came aboard right when the pandemic, I want to say around when it started. And so I wanted to get, you know, to start with what made you come back to senior living operations? I know you were kind of away from that game for a little bit. And I asked that knowing that executive director is not an easy job, especially now. <laughs> well, first of all, hey, Tim, good to chat with you again. Everybody's been separated for far too long because of this pandemic. But to answer your question, a couple of years ago, I was working with Ed Kenny, who was the former president CEO of LCS and now runs their foundation. And he was working with me on putting together the graduate program in senior living administration at Georgetown, which we have done. And his father went to Georgetown, as it turns out. And so LCS gave a very kind endowment to help support getting that program up and running. And so, yes, I've been serving as an adjunct lead instructor and putting that graduate curricula together. And then as part of that, one day Ed said to me, hey, by the way, do you know this community, the Virginian? And I said, well, I know it very well. I've put a number of student interns there over the years. I've lived in Northern Virginia for 35 years. I'm part of that community. Believe it or not, the pastor of my church was the pastor of the Virginian for 20 years. I actually used to go over and have lunch with them at the Virginian. So I said, well, gosh, yeah, I know that community very well. It's got a great 40-year history. Why? He said, well, we just picked up the management contract for it. We're looking for an AD. Are you interested? And so long story short, I just saw a great combination of things, a community that I knew well. They had tremendous plans for a 50 plus million dollar renovation to completely revitalize it top to bottom, every square inch. Seemed like a great thing to do for my community. And to be honest, I kind of missed interfacing with residents. I had kind of drifted away to so many different things over the last several years. And I saw a chance to go back one more time and frankly do what I love best is kind of like an old country doctor just being with my patients. Just a chance to go back one more time and spend a few years with the residents um, as a kind of a capstone to my career. So it's been a lot of fun, except for COVID. <laughs> right, right. And I want to talk with you about about how that has gone. Before we do that, though, just a, a really quick aside. This is something I've been curious about for a while now, and you're the guy to ask. So the Virginian's name, is that at all to do with the old Western? That's the first thing that comes to mind when I when I hear that. No, we get that a lot. There's actually a lot of the Virginians in Virginia, believe it or not. There was the TV show, The Community, it's 40 years old. There's actually a, a resort golf course in Bristol, Virginia called the Virginian. But my favorite, the Virginian, is actually in Charlottesville, right next to the grounds of UVA. It's a restaurant called the Virginian that's been there, I think, since 1923, so almost 100 years. But my wife and kids all went to UVA, so whenever we're down there, 
we eat at the Virginian. So there's a lot of the Virginians. Wow. Uh, you know, I used to live in Northern Virginia and I did not know that. So that <laughs> yeah. is, that is more, the more you know. So I do want to talk with you about COVID. I mean, obviously this is a challenging time and given the Delta yeah. variant and the spread of that, although a lot of the providers that I've talked to seem to be doing pretty well in this period, you know, it uh, seems like a lot of things are still up in the air and things are kind of uncertain with regard to what happens next. So I wanted to kind of hear from you. So how are things on the ground right now, you know, given that we have all this uncertainty? And yeah, I guess, tell me just how things are at your community. You know, it's, it's fluid, right? I think we've all been dealing with this as an industry and, and I've been monitoring it closely, not obviously just at the Virginian and through LCS, which has done a terrific job with this. But, you know, at Georgetown, where I work at a university too, right? And then, so they're going through this. And then, of course, I've got an obligation to stay on top of it in terms of our coursework and understanding. But the, the bottom line is this, it's, you know, it's a pandemic. These things are rare for a reason, hopefully rare for big gaps in between. But ironically, what we've seen, at least at this space in senior living, is we've created kind of these safety islands, actually. If you look at the Virginia, my community, we were the first full continuum community in Northern Virginia to get everyone vaccinated. We were the very first ones way back in January. One of the first of any, even if some of the assisted livings were behind us. So all of our independent living, assisted living, memory care, skilled nurse, every single one of our residents, 100% have been vaccinated for quite some time. Our employee vaccination rate is over 92%. So ironically, we went, you know, a lot of senior living communities went from being, you know, these kind of things that were in the news, right? And these, uh, you know, uh, Petri dishes. And then because we were the first ones to have access we actually kind of most days look at each other and consider ourselves to be on a safety island compared to the external community. So it's completely flipped in a very bizarre way where we we're, we're feel safer at work some days than we do going out to the store. Yeah. And that's something I've heard from other providers too. And that's something that they've said that, you know, they've told me that the residents are telling them that I feel yes. safer in this community than in the surrounding area. They absolutely do. And they went through a lot, by the way. They are an incredible generation of folks. They sustained us many days. They would constantly tell us, you know, it's okay. You're doing what you're supposed to do. Don't worry about us. They were more worried about us some days and reassuring us. Um, it really was a, a unique experience, I think, for everyone in our industry. I think it drew us all closer to our mission, to why we all do this for a living, when for pretty much a year all we had was each other. And we became even more family in a lot of ways than we ever thought we could. We already thought we were family, and it turns out now we're even more family. So, you know, behind every uh, rain cloud, there's a silver lining, I guess. Absolutely. You had mentioned a moment ago the renovation that the Virginian is undergoing for our listeners at home. I believe the dollar amount there previously <laughs> quoted was $56.5 million. It looks like it has some interesting components involved in it. I know that this is also sort of a tech forward renovation as well. So, you know, Andrew, can you describe what the community is undertaking and then also just like generally what spurred on this, uh, this renovation plan? It's a really, well, first of all, LCS has the management contract, but the community is actually owned by a group out of Chicago called Focus Healthcare Group, just an incredible group of folks, a lot of senior housing background in it. And they saw that this was a family-owned community for 40 years. And when the family finally decided to turn it over, they wisely jumped on it very quickly. It's got an unbelievable location in the heart of Northern Virginia. It has 32 acres of green space, which, as you know, if you used to live here, you cannot find 32 acres of green space. So they knew exactly what they were looking at. But it was 40 years old. And what was really exciting for me is, is the approach they wanted which we've kind of morphed into calling it high touch and high tech. This is going to be a very high end resort community, but with all the latest technology. So high touch, high tech was really appealing to me. They were also looking to really almost quadruple the memory care. I've got some background in memory care design. So here was this opportunity for me, a community that I knew, a community that I loved, a community that was looking to reinvent itself and, and not just establish a renovation, very, very serious about making this one of the premier uh, senior living communities and a model in the United States of what a next generation community should look like. I know that part of these plans, I think, involve a pilot of a technology. I believe it's called Obi. Yes. Or, so can you tell me what Obi is all about and what, you, what you're doing with that? 
Well, first of all, it's been a great playground for me because I can, any technology that I think of, uh, they're very open to hearing about. And I happened to learn about OB and what it is. It's a projector in the ceiling and it projects basically video games onto a tabletop or onto the floor. You can do it on the wall if you want. And it was, it's out of Israel. Um, it was actually invented for children. You see it in uh, some food courts, fast food restaurants, and you play with the motion. There's nothing to set up, nothing to take down. You move your hands across the table. And what they very wisely did is, is they saw an opportunity, especially for folks with Alzheimer's-related dementia, to just move their hands and play games. So they've got a um, PhD, a gerontologist, Dr. Micah Hertz in Israel that I've talked to. And she was hired to really kind of reinvent some of these games and applications for people with not only older adults, but people with dementia. So you project it on the table. Again, what I love about it, there's nothing to set up, nothing to take down. And you put the game on there and little bubbles float across the table and you pop them with your fingers and four people can play. And uh, there's a couple of dozen games in there. Um, we're really testing it. So we were one of the, actually one of the first communities in the country to even have it. I happen to know their North American rep. They just came to the United States this spring. And uh, he and I go back a few years in the tech world. And as soon as I saw it, I said, look, we're going to do this. We're going to pilot this. Uh, we set it up. We've had it up for about a month now. And it's, uh, residents are really enjoying it. That's great. I know also, I mean, you. so you, for our listeners at home, uh, you and I have actually talked before I ever read about senior living. And I remember you, I, this was in the, I want to say, the first time we ever talked was in 2013, I want to say. And I remember... You know, when I first sort of got to know you, you know, you're definitely the senior living technology expert. It seemed like even back then you you were pretty well established in that field. And I know that by then you had you were already talking about this phrase that you had coined nanotechnology, kind of, I think, a portmanteau between, you know, kind of nana, another name for grandma and nanotechnology. Yeah. So you've been at this a long time. I think you coined that term back in 2004. I remember reading. So, I think so no. yeah. So, so it's it's been a while since since you started thinking about senior living technology. How you know in that time? How have you seen technology evolve in the senior living industry? Like, what's changed? You know, it's really interesting. And I've said I'm actually. People, so nanotechnology, you're right, it's a play on words. The actual definition is, is any microchip based technology. It has to have a microchip, but that is uh, designed, intended, or that can otherwise be used to improve quality of life for older adults. And some of these technologies actually weren't designed for seniors. I know you and I have talked about the Nintendo Wii, but they can improve quality of life. And there's eight categories that go with it. There's a Wikipedia page for this. But the irony is, is I don't consider myself a tech guy. You know, I crashed my own computer at least four or five times a year. <laughs> but what I saw was, is there was what I call this great divide between geeks and grants. I knew that there was technologies that can improve quality of life for seniors. I knew that we needed them, but I didn't see the connections being made. And so my real focus, even back then, gosh, 15, 16 years ago, was just that I felt very strongly we were going to need these technologies, which has proven, of course, be true, but even more so than we even thought, and even more so going forward. And so I just continue to try to say, look, if there's a technology there, I might not understand technology, I might not understand how it's built, but I think I have an understanding of how it can affect older people's lives. And that's the connection I'm trying to make, is can it make a difference in their lives or how we produce our product? Because we're not going to have enough people, by the way, to staff our communities, and we need to do like the auto industry and start automating. You know, 80% of the car you and I drive every day is built by robots. We're going to have the same issue in senior living here, as we all know. So we need to learn to automate as well. So a lot of applications for technology. You mentioned the Wii, and I know that you have worked a little bit in your time with Nintendo. You and I talked about this yeah. uh, not long ago. I took great interest in that. You know, in my kind of short time, you know, my four years covering this industry, the, one of the big things I've seen coming in and out of communities is just how big Wii Bowling, you know, is and still remains in senior living communities, which, you know, as someone who I think first played Wii Bowling in my college dorm like 15 <laughs> years ago, I never thought people would still be playing it, you know, which it's so it's 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 very cool. So so you're someone who may have had a hand in that. Maybe that's over 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 telling, you know, your role. But but tell me about, you know, I find that so interesting. So what did you do with Nintendo and kind of you had sort of an inside look at how all this came together. So tell me about that. 
Yeah, I certainly wouldn't claim to have brought it all in, but I, I think I certainly was involved. I was in Australia. I was in Sydney in 2006. I was actually delivering a keynote at the 25th Congress on Aging. And one night I was bored, so I left my hotel, went across the street to a mall. And in the middle of the mall, they had a platform and some young people up there demonstrating the Wii. I don't think it had been released in the United States yet. It was kind of released on you know the other side of the world a little bit earlier. Uh, I had heard about it, I hadn't seen it. And you know, the, when I saw it, I just saw what a lot of people would have seen. You know, I used to be a rehab hospital CEO, so my physical therapist had beat into my brain this whole idea of movement, right? I, early on in my career, I used to write about what I called functional assisted living, which was getting people to get up and move instead of getting them their coffee, things like that. And my physical therapist had kind of taught me this. Today, we call it what? Uh, life enrichment and wellness. 20 years ago, I was calling it functional assisted living. Anyway, long story short, I mean, when I saw it, I saw what a lot of people would have seen, low impact range of motion, low impact range of motion, exactly what we were trying to do with our seniors. And then the first game, as you know, because you sat in your door playing it, was the Wii Sport had, you know, bowling, golf, tennis, baseball. Well, those are exactly the things that people did in their retirement. People, you know, were in bowling leagues for 10, 15 years in their retirement. The reason they stopped, they couldn't pick up the ball anymore. So just thought, my gosh, this could really work. Contact Nintendo when I got home. They were a little dubious, actually, because they don't design it for that. But they said, you know, talk to our PR folks. And so I spoke with them. And by the time I explained some of the demographics and some of the numbers, all of a sudden I was the spokesperson for Nintendo for two years, not only for the Wii, but for their brain age games, uh, some of their cognitive games. Uh, I got the prototype things. I know you and I were chatting. My, I was a big hero in my neighborhood because all of these things would show up in my house three, four months before they were on the market. My kids were the most popular kids in the neighborhood. We had you know, the, the Wii and, and games and I actually prototype the Wii Fit, which I decided was not going to work for people who were older. It was too hard to stand on. But yeah, I did that for about two years with Nintendo. And then, you know, we saw the, of course, I talked about Wii Bowling, but a lot of other people noticed this too. And it just grew very, very rapidly. That's so interesting, and, and I'll have to stop fanboying now. I, I, I'm, I'm a self-admitted uh, Nintendo fan, so this is, I, I could probably ask you more questions, but I'll spare our, our listeners. I do want to ask you, though, this is a good segue into kind of how you see technology evolving now. So as you look across the industry today, what technology do you think holds the most promise? And also, as a kind of flip side to that, is there any tech that you look at and think is kind of overblown or maybe too hyped up? or is not, you know, working as intended during the pandemic? I, I think we have to understand, you know, I continue to put these things into buckets, right? I mean, there's what I look at as resident-focused technologies. And then, of course, as an operator, I'm looking at operations, service delivery-focused technologies. And so, really, you got to kind of, sometimes they overlap, but more often than that, you know, you got to, which bucket are you really focused on today? I think that in the end, and so if you look at the resident focus ones like Obi, for example, right? All right. Or you look at uh, virtual reality, which we have at the Virginia or some of these other things. But then on the operations side, it's really about the infrastructure. You know, what we used to call health IT is now health informatics. And it's about predictive analytics. And that's where if you're just looking on the operations side, Predictive analytics, which then morphs into robotics, which then morphs into you know artificial intelligence, and the ability of robots to self-initiate and self-complete tasks, autonomous, right? So this is to me and to everybody, but in our industry, if I were to say to providers, we need to move past this kind of static data tracking, you know, where we just we we, we would retroactively look at data. And then look for trends. You know, are we meeting our benchmarks? We need to go way, way past that. We need to look at predictive analytics. Can we predict UTIs? Can we predict falls before they happen? I used to have a colleague at George Mason, brilliant health informatics guy from Poland. His office is right next to mine. He actually created a program for the Veterans Administration where he could predict with 95% accuracy when a patient in a VA hospital is going to die within about 48 hours. I mean, and it was really accurate. Now, of course, the real purpose of that was to prevent them from dying. If we, if we knew that they were going to die and what was going to cause it, we could prevent it. 
He actually used to really annoy me, Tim, because he would step into my office, stand in the door, and he'd say, "Do you want to know when you're going to die?" Oh uh, gosh! And, and I would say, <laughs> and I would say, "No, get the hell out of my office." Um, but, I would say the same thing. Yeah, but he <laughs> he seemed to be very certain he could give me the answer if he wanted to. But I think it's about predictive analytics at the forefront. And then, you know, you get into the robotics and it's the ability for robots to not only predict their next steps, but to initiate them autonomously. These are the two big things that are going to drive pretty much the world's technology. But we're part of the world, aren't we? And again, we're going to need these technologies. We are not, we are mathematically eliminated from having enough workers. I, I have stressed this at so many conferences. You know, we got to stop denying that, you know, it's going to magically, uh, two million workers are going to show up. They're not. We need to make one worker in the future as productive as three today. And the way we're going to do that is with technology. Yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you mentioned robotics a lot. And one of the things that I've wondered about is in what form will robotics take in senior living? You know, when I first came in into this industry and I heard people talk about robotics, in my mind, I thought, oh, maybe one day there'll be a, you know, robotic caregiver or something wandering around communities. Now that I've, I've spent a little bit more time in senior living, I think that the picture is a little bit more nuanced. But what role do you think robotics will play in senior living in the future? Well, again, anything that can make us more productive and replace workers. And, and, and these are the conversations that are hard to have. I said earlier, you know, 80% of the car I drive every day is built by robots. The auto industry learned a long time ago, mostly because of union wages, uh, but they learned a long time ago that, you know, you needed to automate. You look at McDonald's a few years ago, came out with a, a Big Mac kiosk they put in one of their restaurants, and people thought, oh, that was cool. It's a little kiosk that makes a Big Mac. But what McDonald's was really doing was predicting the future, which was accelerated by COVID, which is there's not enough food workers. And they were trying to get their customers used to the idea that in the not too distant future, pretty much all your food behind the counter is going to be made by robots. Now, what we see in senior living is, is you know, we, well, people, you need people for that. You need people for that. Not if you break it down by functions. You know, we've got robotic medication dispensers that make fewer errors than people, right? We've got, you know, uh, false technology data that, again, if we do predictive analytics that can predict false before they happen. So we've got things, uh, robots that can lift, uh, you know, they're not they're not complete assistive robots. They don't do everything. But a robot that can do a lift, think about how many workers we lose to back injuries. Number one cause of a lost worker in senior living is a back injury. And everybody loses here. They lose their entire career. You lose a worker. But the Japanese have been working on a robot that can do lifts, not a one-person lift, not a two-person lift, a zero-person lift. Well, if you're an executive, what would you pay for that robot? A lot. And you'd still come out ahead if you think about how much workers' comp and back injuries are costing you. So these are the technologies that we need to focus on. And anything that, as I said, if it eliminates steps or if it eliminates time, because that's what our workers are doing. They're either walking or performing a task that absorbs their time. So anything that reduces steps or time is a good technology. Well, I'm always interested to see kind of what what developments come next in that that arena. I want to switch topics. So I mentioned earlier, you're an adjunct lecturer at Georgetown University. I, I did not mention, but you also have worked with George Mason University yep. in Northern Virginia. So I want to talk with you about universities and senior living. I guess first at Georgetown, how big is that senior living program? And what are you seeing among the students going through those programs? You know, do they seem pretty eager to work in senior living given this pandemic? I mean, do, do they usually understand this industry right, right away or do they come into this, I don't know, with different ideas about how this works? It just, if, well, first of all, I have to share with you because I know you're from the D.C. area, but I'm, I'm a proud and rare member of what's called the Triple George Society. I have a master's degree from George Washington University, which is downtown. And then I taught at George Mason out in Northern Virginia. Now I'm at Georgetown. So I do want to brag a little bit that I have, in fact, pulled off the Triple <laughs> George, the rare and elusive. Triple George. It depends if they're undergrad or grad. Look, undergrad students are undergrad students. They're choosing their career path. They're learning about things for the first time. 
they know more about accounting as an accounting major than, than they know about senior living as a senior living major until they get out there and get some experience. So it's really foundational. It's exposing them to the topic. It's putting in their brains as much information as you can to teach them about the history of the industry, the regulatory environment, who the providers are, take them on tours of communities, have them do internships. We have an entire course in senior living operations, an entire course in sales and marketing. But for the undergrads, this is, you know, they're entry into this. Grad students are different, whether it's Georgetown, George Mason, typically a grad student's in their mid-30s on average. Some are older. And there are a lot of them are second career folks or they've been on the periphery of this. You know, they're nurses, right? Or they worked in other areas of healthcare. Something's bringing them into it and they see this opportunity. Maybe their parents live there, but they have work experience. Some of them have executive experience. So that's more about filling in their skill set. Again, almost immersion in senior living that adds to their skill set so that they can come up and practice their craft. By the way, I want to ask the Triple George, kind of like the EGOT of, of, <laughs> of BC. <laughs> I don't know, but it is very hard to find a Triple George person. <laughs> it's like, it's like this, yeah, like those people who win the Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and, and yes, Tony. There you go. It took me 35 years, but I did it. I also want to talk with you. So you and I have uh, talked about university-based retirement communities. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is is that another coin that you termed? Yes. The UBRC? Yes. University-based retirement communities. So we are still seeing some universities going through the difficulties of this pandemic. And I think that's the Delta variant has renewed some of those difficulties. So I could see how universities, I don't I don't know if this is actually happening, but I could see how universities are still having issues with things like enrollment or attendance this year. I suppose that's something that we'll have to wait and see. But I wanted to get your, your take on this. Are university-based or backed retirement communities, are those still worth doing in your view, given all of the... Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me more about kind of why that is. And also, has it gotten easier or harder to do this stuff with the pandemic? Well, again, I think we have to keep repeating over and over, this is temporary. The Great Depression lasted a decade, okay? Um, We got over it. Wars have lasted, you know, years. History moves on. So you have to have things in context. What is the long play here? Now, both universities and senior living providers have been massively affected by COVID. We get it. Anytime there's a mass crowd of people gathering somewhere during the pandemic, there are issues. But that does not change the factors that drive the the demand for this. And what we know is is that this generation of retirees and the next, this generation is the most highly educated demographic in human history. The next generation is going to be more highly educated than that. Study after study has shown that retirees now want three things. They want active, they want intellectually stimulating, and they want intergenerational retirement environments. They do not want to live on what I call an elderly island. It doesn't matter how beautiful the community is when it's out in the middle of nowhere and they have no access to the outside world. You know, a bird in the gilded cage is still in a cage. So think about what I just described, though. Active, intellectually stimulating, intergenerational. I just described the college campus. And these retirees have figured this out. And so, yes, they're drawn to this. It offers exactly what they want. It's very good for the universities as well to bring in these international, these intergenerational um, populations. Every university has a mission to serve their community. Well, 20% of your communities over the age of 65, you might want to be serving them. So it's really a win-win scenario when it's done right. What I will say is, and it's important to share this, these are very complicated models. You cannot find two different, more different worlds than, you know, state universities who serve 20-year-olds and giant state bureaucracies and, you know, for-profit senior living providers who serve 80-year-olds, you know, it's just completely different worlds. So what happened with me is because I happened to have the only academic program and I happened to be a senior living executive, I somehow ended up fluent in both languages. So a lot of the time I just feel like kind of a UN interpreter, um, (laughs) just trying to translate between these two parties something that I think is very, very important to do. Yeah. So before we wrap up, I want to get your take on the future, everyone's favorite topic right now. So I wanted to get your take first on kind of what is in the cards for you and for the Virginian. So, you know, over the next six to 12 months, what should we expect to see out of the community where you work? Well, the Virginian, you know, like a lot of places, COVID certainly impacted our renovation schedule. 
so we're really just not kind of getting going on. We've done some of it. We've done the outdoor grounds, uh, which are spectacular, by the way. We've got a pickleball court, bocce ball courts, and an outdoor grill, dog park called Central Park. It's actually pretty cool with the stuff we've been able to do outdoors for the last year. Um, but we're really just getting started indoors. For me, it's about continuing to try to establish these technologies and these programs moving forward with the Georgetown program. I think for the industry, look, we're all in the same boat. We need more executives. That's why the program at Georgetown is so important. And we need experienced executives. The undergrads are great, but they need three, four, five years post-graduation. We need executive directors right now. So this is where the grad students come in, where they can get out there and very, very quickly become executives. We need more technologies. As I said, if we do not automate, we're in big trouble. We're mathematically eliminated from having enough people. You can build all the senior living communities you want. What was the uh, the Nick study or uh, some of the uh, 100,000 communities a year based on, you know, just the supply of seniors coming into the pipeline? Well, you can build all the Starbucks you want, but somebody's got to pour the coffee and mispronounce your name. So <laughs> we need workers or we need to automate. And that's why I'm so focused, on, again, on not just, and by the way, new models of housing like UBRCs. We need to build what people want, and then we need to be able to staff it. So even though at the start of this conversation, you said, well, gosh, Andy, you've been involved in so many things. But now you begin to see how the dots connect, don't you? Because we need all of these things if we're going to move the industry forward. We need experienced executives. We need new models of housing that people want to live in. And then we need these technologies to make sure we can run them. So it actually does all make sense. Absolutely, it does. So kind of last question, again, given uncertainty with Delta and the lack of clarity about the the upcoming months ahead, I want to get your take. I mean, again, nobody has a crystal ball and I won't hold you to, I won't hold anyone to a hard prediction right now, but what's your best guess on how the rest of this year is going to play out just based on what you're seeing on the ground? You know, it really depends on how quickly people get vaccinated. I think people are waking up to the reality now, kind of snapping out of their denial. Go get vaccinated go get vaccinated. This is a very, very highly contagious variant. No, it may not make you as sick. It may not put you in the hospital, but 99% of the people who are dying are unvaccinated. And if you're in contact with them, that can happen. And by the way, if you're a senior citizen, of the very, very small number of people who have been vaccinated and have died, unfortunately, a significant percent of them have been over the age of 65 or even 85. So there is a risk there. So um, we just need to, to stay on this. We can't let down our guard. Maybe we took a breath at halftime. Maybe maybe we're, we're now into the fourth quarter. This is going to peak probably in the fall by most estimates. But if we continue to get vaccinated, we can bring this to a close much quicker. Well, those are good, hopeful words to end on. I hope that that happens sooner rather than later. Andrew Carl, thank you so much for joining me on Transform. This has been a great discussion. Tim, it's been great chatting with you again. That does it for this episode of Transform. I would again like to mention our upcoming build event in Chicago on November 17 and 18. Be sure to visit seniorhousingnews.com slash events for the latest updates on build and our other scheduled events. Again, I'm Tim Regan for Senior Housing News. Thanks for listening.